Finally, uh, part three of chapter 27, the expansion of American imperialism from 1890 to 1909. Now, beyond the Spanish-American War, beyond the annexation of Hawaii, beyond the issues to deal with uh, the Philippines, uh, the United States is also looking to expand its world power elsewhere in the world, namely into China. Um, China, obviously a large country, they were defeated in the Sino-Japanese War um, of 1894-1895. And the European powers, who are already busy carving up other parts of Asia, Africa, etc., uh, look to China as a way to get in there and start dividing it up um, because the government was obviously in a weak state. Um, American obviously, Americans obviously wanted to have business dealings with their, uh, there, but they were very worried that the Europeans were going to monopolize all of China and the United States businesses wouldn't have a chance to get in and have their fair share of the Chinese markets um, that they wanted. And so Secretary of State at the time, John Hay, issued the open door note or the open door policy in 1899 to all of the European powers of the world, demanding that all the European powers of the world respect Chinese right to stay open to everyone, that nobody's allowed to, quote, carve China up. Uh, basically, that they acknowledged uh, open ports uh, and nobody was going to take control of any part of China so that everyone would be able to have a fair share of controlling China for its economic purposes. Now notice here that this is not uh, an open door in order to respect China's integrity. It's about allowing every European and American uh, business uh, interest to go into China and have its way with China. So this open door policy uh, really didn't look too good to the Chinese people. And so in 1900, a group of nationalistic Chinese, uh, popularly referred to as the Boxers, um, uh, rebelled against the, this foreign influence. And their goal was to, quote, kill the foreign devils, to push all foreign influences out of China, and to restore a, an independent China for themselves. Uh, they killed uh, white people, missionaries, any foreign diplomats they could, and laid siege to Beijing. Now, in order to ensure that each of these countries had its uh, business interests um, fulfilled, uh, it took an international force to put down this boxer rebellion. 18,000-man uh, army, the t Americans uh, uh, sending 2,500 soldiers to put this boxer rebellion down. And once the Boxer Rebellion was put down, China was forced to pay an indemnity or reparations for uh, rising up against uh, the Europeans and Americans. Um, uh, $333 million charged to them for, uh, for this Boxer Rebellion. Um, and so after the Boxer Rebellion, now this is also going to include, like I said, territorial integrity. China should stay whole so that everyone has a chance to uh, make money off of China. Here you see two political cartoons depicting drastically different views of the open door. The one on the left is how Uncle Sam uh, is facing a lot of guns if he walks through that open door of China. The one on right is more of a jingoistic view that Uncle Sam has no problem boxing with this box over here. And obviously his fists are our strong steel navy. Now, in the middle of all of this imperialism of the day comes the 1900 election, which obviously this is going to be a big focus for the 1900 election. William McKinley was renominated for the Republicans, uh, focusing once again on that gold standard and the fact that he had provided a full dinner pail, meaning they'd had a lot of economic prosperity during his four years in office. Uh, he had been successful at achieving the goals during the Spanish-American War, and they had expanded uh, to um, different parts of the world. Uh, the change here, however, comes with putting T Teddy Roosevelt as the VP. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a meteoric rise to power. Um, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, head of the Rough Riders, he'd been governor of New York at this time, and now he was put on the VP, can uh, on the VP ticket to get him out of there because he wasn't abiding by the machine politics in New York. The VP position at this time isn't very powerful, so this was meant to... Um, kind of keep him busy without actually causing any damage. But as Mark Hanna put it, who was the campaign manager, uh, he's just there's just one heart between that damned cowboy and the presidency. So he was very fearful of that 
issue. Um, the Democrats, however, once again nominate our old friend William Jennings Bryan. And while he does bring up the silver issue, the economy is doing really great at this time. So the silver issue almost takes a back seat to the anti-imperialism that he had begun touting during the Spanish-American War and the debate over the Philippines. Um, the problem for William Jennings Bryan, and even though he campaigned like a crazy person across the United States, Teddy Roosevelt was very, very popular in the Midwest where um, William Jennings Bryan had gotten a lot of his votes the last time. And so in the end, uh, William McKinley won re-election 292 electoral votes to 155 for William Jennings Bryan. And especially since, once again, the economy is doing great, that this Bryanism that he's uh, focusing on could actually hurt our prosperity, cause people to vote for McKinley again. Uh, here is the popular Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and here is the administration's promise have been kept. You notice on the left side in 1896 when we had gone Democrat, the factories were closed, there were runs on the banks, and the Spanish were in charge down in Cuba. But by 1900, the factories are back up and running, the farms are going great, uh, people are depositing their money, and now the Americans are in charge in Cuba. Things are awesome under McKinley. Very quickly after this election, though, in September of 1901, um, William McKinley was visiting the Pan-American Conference in uh, Buffalo, New York, and was assassinated by a anarchist reject, Leon Kalgosh. Uh, he walked up to the president and had a, a gun hidden in his pocket and shot and killed uh, William McKinley. And so just like that, Teddy Roosevelt, or like I said before, that damned cowboy, is now the president of the United States. Now, Teddy Roosevelt is very much a dichotomy when it comes to your classic American uh, president. He absolutely has the upbringing that the other presidents has. He He's a blue blood. He's from a wealthy family. He went to Harvard, but he's also worked as a rancher, as a cowboy. He was the assistant secretary of the Navy, but he's also um, uh, fought in a war. So he is showing both sides, and he is very popular amongst the American people. Um, he very much is in favor of naval preparedness, which we've already talked about. Um, he is against pacifists, like I said, he is a jingo, and he wants to serve as a role model for physical fitness for the American people. And so his foreign policy colloquially is known as big stick diplomacy. Uh, and this is based on a carving he had in his office that said, walk softly and carry a big stick, which basically means he's not going to get out there and get loud and obnoxious and, you know, uh, yell at all the other countries, so to speak. Um, he's going to have a strong military or a, quote, big stick to back up what he wants. He doesn't need to yell at Latin America, but they're going to do what he wants because he is so much stronger than them. Countries are going to lay down and do what he wants, especially in Latin America and elsewhere. Uh, here you see a depiction of the assassination of William McKinley. And one of the first areas that uh, Teddy Roosevelt is going to focus his big stick diplomacy is in Panama. Now, the Spanish-American War brought about a renewed interest in the building of a canal through Latin America. For example, when the war broke out, the USS Oregon had been stationed in the Pacific, and it was badly needed to get to the Caribbean. However, there is no easy way for a ship to get from the Pacific to uh, the Caribbean, except for going all the way down around the southern tip of South America and then back up again. And so this renewed this interest. We need a canal in order to get very very quickly from one side of our continent to another, especially now that we have colonies in the Philippines, in Hawaii, etc. We have to be able to administer to all of our country colonies all over the world. The problem is we have the clayton Bulwer Treaty to deal with from 1850 with Great Britain. But now, Great Britain and the United States have had an easing of, uh, of uh, hostilities. A great rapprochement has occurred. Uh, they've become a lot more friendly in the last several years. And so in 1901, uh, they passed the hay ponce Vote Treaty uh, in order to allow for the building of a Panama Canal and not get Great Britain so angry at them. But instead of focusing on the old uh, Nicaragua plan, now the focus is focusing on Panama. Uh, a French company had already started um, 
working on to building a canal through Panama, but that company went bankrupt. So the United States said, well, we'll just get in there and take over uh, that canal. The problem here is that Panama is not an independent country. Panama is owned by Colombia. Colombia at this time is the mother country to Panama. And Colombia is not willing to work with the United States on this. They were demanding way too much money um, for this territory. But Teddy Roosevelt is not going to allow this to happen. He wants to have an issue that he can run on in the 1904 election. He wants to be able to say, look what I have done for you. Please reelect me. So he's going to use that big stick diplomacy to force his way into Panama. And so in November of 1903, uh, in part with the help of the United States and uh, um, uh, American businesses down there, um, a Panama, quote-unquote, revolution occurs um, against Colombia. However, the U.S. Navy was backing up this Panamanian revolution. Now, obviously, there is uh, some wiggle room here, but it doesn't matter. Teddy Roosevelt is going to get done what he wants to get done. And so within three days after this revolution, the United States recognized the new Panamanian government. Obviously, we are the ones propping up this um, government. And very quickly pushed through a treaty with the new Panamanian government, the Hayes-Bunavaria Treaty which is basically offering the same price that we had offered to Colombia before um, for a 10-mile mi square, or I'm sorry, a 10-mile wide area for this canal. Basically about $10 million and about $250,000 a year after that. Uh, uh, the Panamanian government accepts it, and the United States is good to go with the building of the Panama Canal. However, this absolutely strains relations with other Latin American countries because the United States is throwing its, hit their weight around. This big stick diplomacy does not look that great when you're on the other side of it. Um, and so this big brother mentality really lowers uh, relations with uh, Latin America for years and years to come. But Teddy Roosevelt doesn't care. He says he has a mandate from civilization to build this canal, that other people will benefit from it as well. And so the canal began being built in 1904. Um, there are obviously labor issues. There were landslide sanitation issues that had to be dealt with, uh, specifically all those things that we've seen uh, down in the tropics before, like I said, yellow fever, malaria, etc. But it doesn't matter. Within 10 years, the Panama, Panama Canal was finished in 1914 for a grand total of $400 million, which is perfect timing because World War I is just around the corner, and this was going to be a necessary uh, piece to moving troops overseas. Uh, here you see where that canal was built. And here is a political cartoon depicting Teddy Roosevelt, larger than life, using his big stick to shovel uh, dirt out of the way. And notice where he's throwing it on Bogota, which is the capital of Colombia, while ships anxiously await him at the foot. So, Teddy Roosevelt, this big stick diplomacy extends elsewhere. Um, Teddy Roosevelt... Um, really did not want Europe get being involved in Latin America, especially since a lot of these Latin American countries owed a lot of debt to European countries, uh, particularly the two big ones were the Dominican Republic and Venezuela. He was worried about Europeans coming over to Latin America to try to recollect their debt and therefore staying and colonizing these areas. He saw this would be a uh, major problem, especially um, when it comes to the Monroe Doctrine. So he issues a corollary or an add-on. It's like a post-it note onto the Monroe Doctrine. The Roosevelt Corollary is an add-on to the Monroe Doctrine. This is a new foreign policy that not only would we not allow for Europe to come over to our backyard, but now the United States is going to intervene in Latin America if there is ever economic distress and we are going to take care of the problem. So it's no longer we're going to disallow Europe from coming over here. Now the United States is actively going to intervene in the affairs of Latin American countries if they are in economic distress. We are going to serve as the regional police force for uh, our hemisphere. Uh, it is rejecting isolationism in exchange for economic imperialism. And from a 
Latin American perspective, this is really a bad neighbor policy. This only angers Latin America even more, especially when the United States does intervene in, Dominican Repu in the Dominican Republic to collect money for their debts. Now, the United States is also going to get involved elsewhere in the world, namely with Japan. Uh, there aren't that many Japanese living in the United States uh, at this time, but where there were Japanese was mainly on uh, the West Coast. There is a lot of racism aimed at the Japanese um, and for obvious reasons that we've talked about with every other immigrant group prior to this. Um, they are, quote, stealing our jobs, and they wanted to deny them citizenship rights. Uh, Newspapers of the day called them the yellow peril, uh, that they're coming in, absolutely promoting this xenophobic mentality that we want to keep these foreigners out, and especially in the San Francisco schools. The San Francisco schools had begun segregating uh, the children, forcing Japanese children to go to a different school, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean, to be fair. Now, Japan was very sensitive to how its uh, citizens were viewed by the world. And they were so angry over this segregation in San Francisco schools, which is very random, that they began saying, either do something about this or we're going to take care of it. It's almost a war posturing mentality. Now, Teddy Roosevelt, he's not looking to go to war with Japan over a stupid issue in the California schools in San Francisco. And so instead, he works with Japan to create what's known as the Gentleman's Agreement. Basically, this is an informal agreement between the United States and Japan uh, to help limit immigration coming to the U.S. That Japan promised that they would limit the amount of immigrants who are allowed to leave Japan to come to the United States in exchange for the United States stopping the discrimination of the Japanese who are already living here. Uh, so this helps to lower the tensions between the U.S. and Japan. Um, but as a way to prove how awesome the United States, States is, once again, uh, the United States uh, wants to show its naval strength. The Great White Fleet had been built and completed by 1907. This is a new all-steel navy, um, painted white, 16 new naval warships uh, that went on a worldwide tour, tour to show the rest of the world how awesome we are militarily. Once again, jingoism all over this. 43,000 miles uh, around the world, including Japan uh, to show our power. Um, last but not least, the Root Takahira Agreement of 1908 uh, promised once again to respect each other's territorial possessions with Japan and to maintain the open door in China. Uh, here you see the Great White Fleet on its tour across the world. Uh, and here you see the expansion of the United States from where it had once been uh, elsewhere in the world. And even though the United States, obviously this is the focus of American imperialism, they are by no means the only ones. This is the era of imperialism. Europe was carving up Africa, carving up Asia, um, uh, etc. at this same exact time. And that is it for Chapter 27.